Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Gallery of Modern Art and uh, 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 this terrific uh, evening of the Asia Perspective series. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all here and acknowledge in particular our special guest, our speaker, Richard McGregor. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Francis Song, the Deputy Director General of the Taipei Economic Cultural Office in Brisbane, and also Ms. Zhu Li, who is the Deputy Consul General for the Chinese Consulate in, in Brisbane. Welcome everybody, welcome guests. My name's Simon Elliott, I'm the Deputy Director here, and uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the ground in which we, we meet, the Jagara and Yagara people, and uh, express my appreciation for all they do for the, the uh, culture of Australia, and in particular, as an art gallery person, for the visual arts of this country to the world. It's a great privilege to show their art in the gallery. Um, for the, um, I'd like to uh, recognise and acknowledge what the great work with the Griffith Asia Institute are partner in the Perspectives Asia program. Um, we enjoy working with them uh, regularly and indeed it's part of our outreach to the region uh, to connect with peers in Asia and, and the region that surrounds Australia. <clears throat> As many of you will know, in a few months' time, we will open the ninth Asia-Pacific Triennial of Art. The Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art, is really proud of this signature exhibition. And it draws across the culture and insights of contemporary artists working in the area, and we bring them to Brisbane. And we do this every three years, and it's a fantastic thing to see and do. Next week, no, you're the first to know this, a major Chinese artist, Zhu Zhiji, is coming out and painting on the big walls that you see that are blank just outside this, uh, the galleries where you just were. So he starts on Sunday and works for a week and you're free to come in and watch art in the making and it will be the first time of one of our major commissions for APT. It will beginning to unfold for the people of Brisbane. So tell your friends. The other thing that we're doing uh, a bit later on is uh, another APT artist from China, Chao Fei, um, is exploring a striking imagined take on implications of e-commerce in China through a story of a love triangle between a robot assistant and the only two human workers in a fully automated logistics hub. How's that? <laughs> but let's get on to, to this evening. Tonight, Perspective Asia session focuses on the rise of China in Asia, America, and Australia. What could be more topical today, except perhaps the odd leadership challenge? <laughs> These are the repercussions of the clash of civilizations for a global community, not the Liberal Party, but uh, the, uh, the, the topic. We're joined by senior fellow of East Asia at the Lowy Institute and Chinese political expert, Richard McGregor. Richard was the former bureau chief of the Financial Times in Beijing and Washington DC. Richard has also worked for the BBC, the Far Eastern Economic Review, the International uh, Herald Tribune, the Australian and the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. He is a former journalist and author who has won numerous awards for his reporting on China and East Asia. His book, The Party, on the inner workings of the Chinese Communist Party was labelled a masterpiece by The Economist, and his latest book on Sino-Japanese relations, Asia's Reckoning, China, Japan, and the Fate of the US in the Pacific Century, was reviewed as shrewd and knowing by the Wall Street Journal and the best book of the year by the Literary Review of the UK. Richard, I don't know how you get such good reviews, but can you share to us later? Okay. Uh, Richard will discuss how the contentious history between China and the US has led to current struggles surrounding trade and te technology. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Richard McGregor. Um, thank you, Simon. I see Simon's already made a few of the Liberal Party jokes. Um, <laughs> I was going to note that I'm closer to the epicentre of Australian politics um, than last week. I live in Bondi Junction, which is quite close to Malcolm Turnbull. I think you're... Well, you might be much closer. We'll see what happens uh, tomorrow. Um, 
I don't think any of it went, ends well, but I'm, that's not what I'm here to talk about. Now, there's one word that's left out there. It should be Japan as well. Because um, I am going to talk about my latest book and hopefully use that to illustrate the broader themes in this lecture about evolving Asian security and where that leaves Australia. So I'm going to start with a bit of self-promotion. Now, the focus of my book was Sino-Japanese relations, which I have to admit, not for this highly sophisticated audience here, was a bit of a hard sell for many, uh, a lot of people outside the area of Asia studies. Uh, I wrote it when I was living in Washington, and I remember saying to one of you know one very worldly person in Washington that I was going to write a book about Sino-Japanese relations, and he said to me, he said, "That's great. That's really interesting. Um, just don't use that phrase, Sino-Japanese. You know, that'll turn people off." Um, in any case, I've done a few books, and I think this will sound quite banal, but a, a good um, uh, rule of thumb for books is to start from the dust jacket backwards. Uh, it's very helpful, I think, to, you know, if you're forced to distill your ideas and big themes, and if you do that, then you can sort of make sure they resonate all throughout the book. I might say that a dust jacket is more than 140 characters, so you do have a little bit of space, more than Twitter. But I didn't do that with this book. I, I simply was, I wrote it for the best of reasons. I lived in both Japan and China for some years, and I was always interested in how the two countries related to each other. So really, I wanted to write about, from my perspective, one of the most consequential relationships in the world. Uh, and I don't mean that in a sort of, I hope, an eat your sort of broccoli sense, but, but let, let me illustrate that for you. If you go into a bookshop in the US, there's a cottage industry of books about US-China relations, uh, the US, Middle, the US and the Middle East, the war on terror and the like. You go into the UK uh, bookstores, or I lived in the UK briefly, you'll see a similar sort of cottage industry of books about you know, the UK and Europe, the UK and France, um, now of course Brexit uh, and so on, UK and Germany, the war, uh, in Australia, we're inundated with books on uh, Australia and Asia, Australia and the US and the like, and all that sort of stuff. But I guarantee you, you'll see almost nothing about China and Japan. Um, you know, a few years ago, when we were waging the war against ISIS, you know, one thing we didn't care about was the impact on the caliphate's GDP. We didn't even really care about the impact on the price of oil at that time. But if there were any conflict between China and Japan, that would instantly reverberate around the world. Basically, the entire global trading economy goes through China and Japan, along with you know, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, and you know, a few of the Southeast Asian countries. So anything that happens there, it's instantly transmitted to just about every shop, every avenue of business uh, around the world. Um, now, I haven't tried to you know, dra dramatic, uh, overly dramatize the relations between the two countries. I didn't call it, you know, the coming war between China and Japan, uh, because I don't think there's about to be a coming war. And there's lots of coming war books. You can sort of track them from the 80s and 90s onwards. Um, but I do think, actually, that the two countries did come close in 2012 to a possible um, you know, military clash of some kind over the disputed Senkaku Diaoyu Islands. Uh, you know, so it's, you know, Right now, Japan and China are getting on much better for various reasons I can talk about later. But, you know, it's something that you need to keep, uh, that, you know, that doesn't get the attention um, it deserves. Now, Japan and China is consequential in another way, in a counterintuitive sense. Imagine if they did get on. Imagine if China and Japan were actually friends. There would be no more Pax Americana in East Asia. That would be long gone. The Korean Peninsula would look very different. Taiwan would look very different. And of course, the sort of world that Australia's enjoyed since 1945, you know, in East Asia, in which the most powerful country has been the US, well, that would be gone. You know, we might get there in a, a few decades in any case. But if China and Japan did get on, the world would look totally different. US power would look totally different. But of course, Japan and China haven't really managed to get on. And of course, for the US, for people who believe in the US-led world, that's a good thing. You know, many in the US don't want China and, and Japan to get on too well, 
because that would mean there was no more um, need for the US uh, in East Asia. You must remember, and people forget this, uh, you know, the America's biggest bilateral military ally is Japan. The country with the most US troops in it overseas is not Germany, it's not the UK, it's Japan. And people sort of, I think, gloss over that simply because it's part of the furniture. Anyway, there's a number of themes running through my book. Uh, and I think they're all helpful in understanding where we're at in East Asia and Southeast Asia today. Uh, the first is the bilateral relationship. The second is history. Uh, not just the history wars, but the history of the history wars, which is a much better way of looking at it. The third is how the US and Pax Americana have helped, hindered, and harried bilateral ties between China and Japan. So first, the bilateral relationship. Why don't China and Japan, Asia's two superpowers, why don't they get on? Both of these countries were modernised at the point of an imperialist gun. Um, you know, the black ships coming into Yokohama in the case of the US, uh, various, the opium wars and the like, in the, sorry, in the case of Japan, the opium wars and the like in the case of China. Um, the, uh, uh, Japan coped with that. It's a well-known story, the Meiji Revolution, however, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Japan modernised rapidly and became a strong and militarily strong country. Uh, and, of course, um, uh, China did not cope with it, and China was broken up by Western powers, uh, and we have following that what the Chinese call the century of humiliation. Um, now, an important part of the Japan-China story and imperialism, of course, is that Western countries, the white man and woman, looked down on Asian nations initially as inferior, racially inferior. And it took a long time for both Japan and, and Australia had a role in that, by the way, but it took a long time for Japan and uh, uh, China to get respect out of Western countries, to be treated as equals, on par with them. The ir ironic point about that, of course, is that Japan and China have always struggled to treat each other as equals. Uh, initially, it was Japan, China the big brother, then Japan became strong, uh, uh, Japan was actually a beacon of modernization for China in the 1910s, 1920s. Then Japan militarized, invaded China, annexed part, large parts of the country, and then, of course, the brutal war followed. Um, the, you know, when I used to live, when I lived in Beijing, one of the things when I was working there, you often meet a lot of businessmen coming in, and they would always. Uh, tell you after, you know, as people do when they come in and get first impressions, often very insightful, sometimes not. But I would often get lectures by people telling me about how China, a powerful China, was recreating the old um, sort of foreign policy system or diplomatic system that existed, you know, back in uh, the Ming Dynasty and the like of the, the tributary system where weaker countries would pay tribute to China and, uh, and China would leave them alone. Uh, and, you know, I always sort of dismiss this as pop sinology. But um, these days I'm starting to think more and more that it's true, or at least people think it's true. In other words, out, uh, many Asian countries think China thinks like that, but, of course, the Japanese are different. They're the standout. The Japanese say we have never been part of a Chinese tributary system and we never will be. So they're quite um, uh, set apart. So that's one theme. Then there's the war. Uh, and that provides the conventional explanation for Sino-Japanese and enmity these days. Uh, the first thing to note about the war is that it's not fake news. <clears throat> uh, it's, as some right-wing Japanese will still say, gratingly, Japan invaded China. They didn't advance in there. They killed hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and they never apologise later. I mean, that bit's not true, but that's, that's the conventional explanation. Now, anti-Japanese uh, propaganda in China works for the very good reason that, as I said, it is true. Uh, um, the atrocities were real. Um, uh, there was a 731 unit in Manchuria uh, which conducted live experiments, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the history wars. But if you look at the history of the history, of the history wars, it's a much more complex story than the simple morality tale that you get 
uh, mostly out of China. There's layers and layers of hypocrisy in both sides on this issue. Let me give you one quote and see if you can guess who said this. It says, you cannot be asked to apologize every day, can you? It is not good for a nation to feel constantly guilty, and we can understand this point. That was Chairman Mao, talking to a delegation from the Japanese Socialist Party in 1955. Now, that was a long time ago, um, but he and Zhou Enlai, his premier and foreign minister at different times, made many similar comments over, over time. Uh, Mao, for example, in the early 60s, famously uh, told another Japanese delegation, he said, actually, no need to apologise, we should be thanking you. Because, of course, if, if, if you, know, you hadn't invaded us and uh, you know, fought against the Nationalist Party, uh, then we would have never won the Civil War and we wouldn't be here in power today. Now, of course, Mao was quite sardonic, but he did say it, and more to the point, the Chinese policy of not asking for an apology, not asking for reparations, was official policy in China in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and into the 80s. Um, the Nanjing Massacre, not the Nanjing incident, the Nanjing Massacre. Now that, of course, is another real event, but if you look at the People's Daily for the 1950s, you won't find any mention of it. It was never forget, forgotten in Nanjing itself, or where local citizens actually from the 1960s onwards used to collect information about it. But that was not a theme of you know, Chinese political discourse in the 50s and the 60s and the like. It wasn't mentioned much at all, really, until the 70s uh, and the 80s. Now, I think China, in not asking Japan for a proper apology, in not asking for reparations, uh, made a very big mistake uh, because it lulled the Japanese political system into believing that it could get away with what had happened without ever really addressing it. Um, you know, when Japan and China formed uh, uh, diplomatic ties in 1972-73, they barely mentioned the war. There was no ceremony to uh, commemorate the victims. There was no monuments built or anything like that. They simply did a deal, which was in the sort of the zeit geopolitical zeitgeist at the time, which was anti-Soviet, and sort of life went on. So when the political mood in China changed and China started to want to talk about the war and want to talk about getting an apology, uh, the Japanese did not know how to handle it. Many in Japanese didn't want, Japan didn't want to address it. We've had this, our own experience with the Japanese in Australia on this issue. Um, and as we all know, you know, the Japanese have tied themselves in knots on the apology issue. Of course, the big thing is Japan's apologised lots of times, but every time somebody from Japan apologises, a few days later, somebody unapologises. <laughs> and so there's never kind of, you know, the issue is never really settled. So, but over time, of course, the Japanese themselves became cynical uh, about China demanding an apology. Here's another great quote. It says, we can apologise as much as China wants. It's free, and very soon China will be tired of asking for apologies. <clears throat> they never did get tired, by the way. Um, um, th that was from a, one of the great old Japanese warlords, a man called uh, Takeshita, who was prime minister and finance minister. Uh, the Australian scholar Hugh White, I'm sure who many of you have heard of, uh, he used to work for Bob Hawke. When I was working in Japan in 1991 or so, this very early days, when there was a time when we were trying to get the Japanese to you know, play a greater role in the world. And I remember Bob Hawke met Mr. Takeshi and I asked Hugh White later, I said, um, I said, well, what was it like? What was Takeshi like? You know, he was an important figure in those days. And Hugh said to me, he, what, he thought about it and he said, Delphic, but not content free. Uh, and I felt that's a lot, a lot of dealing with the Japanese that like that. Anyway, there, but there's a, um, a broader point here, I think, uh, for Australia. Um, um, you know, we went through a lot with Japan on the war and post-war period. We had a lot, it used to, have, used to be a very uh, more intense issue of bilateral discussions in the 90s and the like. Uh, for China, it's still a big issue. I think many Chinese people still, you know, 
China and allies, China and Australia were allies during the war, was the ROK, but uh, ROC, I'm sorry. Um, and I think China still presses this issue in Singapore, places like that, Malaysia, countries which are occupied by Japan, Indonesia and the like. You know, um, uh, Japan either invaded these countries or these countries fought against Japan. And I think there's a suggestion that such bonds should still endure these days. Uh, but I don't really think that works anymore. I think in Australia's case, and some of you might correct me if I'm wrong, I think the anti-Japan card is played out. Uh, we're on to another era these days. Uh, other countries, China and of course South Korea, have not moved on. So unresolved history, that's another theme running through the book. Uh, finally, the US. Um, I tried to make this a trilateral account because you can't talk about East Asia since the war unless you also talk about the US. That's the diplomatic setting, the San Francisco Treaty, which was used to set up the region um, after the war. The Jap Chinese were not invited to that. They were not at the table, so quite naturally, uh, they don't say that they're bound by it or not bound by it. Um, they certainly don't sort of at, um, think they should have to adhere to it in the future. China looks back at other diplomatic in instruments beforehand, the Cairo and Potsdam declarations. Uh, and I think over time, if not explicitly, I think China would like to unravel the San Francisco system, or at least modify it to suit or reflect its own interests, which are, of course are changing in front of our eyes these days. Um, but the broader picture I think about the US is, and um, I look at East Asia this way. East Asia since the war, I think, has been an economic success, but a political failure. Now, what do I mean by that? The economic success is pretty obvious for all of us to see. Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, now China, the biggest of them all, a couple of the Southeast Asian tigers uh, and the like. Um, there's many reasons these countries succeeded. There's as another cottage industry of books about the East Asia miracle, clever bureaucrats, educated, diligent workforce, protectionism, uh, capital and financial controls, uh, wide open export markets. Um, I'll come back to that in the US in particular. But there's another factor which is often overlooked, I think, and that is the US military. If you think about it since the war, the Korean Civil War has never been solved. The Chinese Civil War has never been resolved. Uh, Sino-Japanese tensions, they wax and wane, but have been really uh, high at many times. Now, the one reason why all these sort of you know, conflicts formed in the 50s have been able to sit there unresolved is the US military, which has really kept the peace in East Asia um, uh, you know, since 1945 or since the early 50s. Uh, so all the, I mean, all these sort of frozen in the 50s conflicts have their own intrinsic dynamics, um, but they're all starting to, I think, you know, unravel now or thaw uh, in a way which over, I think, coming decades is going to transform the region and make it look very difficult and different. Now, I think Trump illustrated this issue very well in his campaign. Pax Americana, that is the US as the number one power in East Asia, so much part of the furniture that once Trump started to attack it, I think nobody could, you know, really was able to articulate a case in favor of the existing order. Um, one reason for that obviously is that Asia, America and Asia has become inextricably linked to trade. Uh, in the case of Trump, trade deficits which you know, the US has run with Japan since the 50s, South Korea since the 60s, and China, I guess, for 20 or 30 years. And if you look at the states that gave Trump the presidency, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, they hate being called the Rust Belt because that, you know, the Rust Belt story is in fact a long story and they've changed a lot. But they are all places with large populations who feel they've had their lives or communities destroyed because of trade and mainly trade uh, with Asia. Now, there's some basis for that. I mean, the US deliberately opened its market to South Korea and Japan uh, uh, so they could become strong and powerful allies. They wanted them to become stronger. 
Um, and you know, the policy worked all too well, and Trump was able to exploit that brilliantly. And in fact, of course, he continues to run on that in office today. It's an issue that I think animates him more than anything else, and he's very consistent on it. If you go back onto YouTube, you can see Trump in the 1980s talking to Ofra Winfrey, and he's talking about Japan. Uh, in that case, and if you could just change Japan with China, it would sound almost exactly the same. So that's the measure Trump uses. <clears throat> he judges the open openness of the market, of course, by whether they have a trade deficit or surplus with the US or not. In the case of uh, Australia, of course, we run a very large uh, deficit with the US, but I think he, he doesn't kind of, you know, <clears throat> he sort of moves on when that comes up. Anyway, so all of these debates about Japan and China and the US, about history, the post-war architecture in Asia, China's rise, uh, the relative decline of the US and Japan, or as one Chinese academic put it, China has destabilized the region by getting strong. The US and Japan have destabilized the region by getting weak. All of those themes, I think, help build a clearer picture of where we are at the region uh, in the moment, at the moment. Now, the most popular conceptual framework for looking at this in the States, in the US last year, I think one of the best-selling uh, foreign policy books in America, sadly selling much more than my book did, um, was, the, was the book about the so-called Thucydides trap. Um, um, I'm glad I can say Thucydides before dinner, not after dinner. It gets harder. You know, if you, you talk about Malcolm Turnbull, um, uh, he, he says, oh, I've, I'd always talk to President Xi about the Thucydides trap and how we must not fall into it. Now, the Thucydides trap, you know, is from the Peloponnesian Wars. It's the idea, uh, to put it, boil it down simply, that a rising power, China, is almost destined to go to battle against an established power, the US. In other words, it's fashionable shorthand for des describing the collision course that the US and Japan are on uh, in East Asia. Anyway, it's nice and neat. I think it's too narrow. You can't simply distill the region down to the US and China, the idea that they can divide everything up uh, and the like. And I think there's a much better um, way of summing up the geostrategic dilemma, also that uh, in Thucydides. And he said, it is dangerous to build an empire. It is even more dangerous to give it away. And I think that's where we are at the moment. So this is the other Thucydides trap, and it much more fully encapsulates the uh, quandary that faces the US uh, in the region. After more than seven decades as the region's hegemon, the US has now has to face China's rise. It can stand and fight uh, at great cost, or it could retreat from East Asia, potentially trailing chaos uh, in its wake. Uh, of course, China knows this. You know, China is adept at reminding us often that China is a geopolitical fact in the region. For the US, its presence is a geopolitical choice. So back to Trump. It's hard to avoid him. Where does he stand on the issue of China and Japan? And of course, the US protecting Japan as a treaty ally. How would he react if China and Japan did in fact fall into conflict? Even this story I get from a friend at The Economist magazine, not somebody who reviewed my book, Simon, by the way, that quote, um, but the uh, he interviewed Trump in, I think, late uh, 2016, even before people thought he'd be the Republican nominee, let alone the president. Um, and he, um, uh, he asked him, well, come on, you know, you've been saying, I don't care about Japan. I don't care if Japan gets the, a nuclear weapon. You know, China, Japan can do what it likes, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so the, econ the economist reporter asked Trump about this, and Trump said, you know, Trump, the way he thinks, he said, oh, the f he'd just been to Los Angeles. He'd seen lots of Jap Japanese cars coming off uh, the container ships. And he said, oh, my, I've just been there. I all these cars just pouring off these ships. And I'm saying to myself, we send them beef. It's a tiny fraction. And by the way, they don't even want it. 
as with Trump a lot of the time, he hits the nail on the head. Then he did the whole sort of thing, by the way, I love China, I love Japan. Um, and then the, the uh, reporter brings him back to the issue about, you know, would the US defend uh, Japan in the event of a conflict with China? And Trump was quite unfazed by this. And he said, if we step back, the Japanese will protect themselves very well. Remember when Japan used to beat China routinely in wars? You know that, right? Japan used to beat China all the time. Why are we defending them at all? So I'm not saying that's the view of uh, Americans generally or the Pentagon, but it's certainly Trump's view. And in his crude sort of way, it might be the view of a lot more people than we come to, uh, would like to think. But as I said, for all Trump's capacity to shock, he does hit the nail on the head sometimes. And I think there's an underlying point about all his rhetoric about Asia exploiting the US and what is the US doing in Asia anyway all these years after the war. Uh, and th and th that point is, why can't Asia be run by Asians? What is the US doing there? Um, that, are they there forever? Uh, in, so in a sense, I've already answered that question. They're there because the big powers in Asia don't get on. And so Japan wants America there through gritted teeth, by the way. The Japanese both deeply resent America and rely on it. I'm happy to talk about that. Um, but so how does America ever go home if that's the case? Is it sustainable? Um, we are, I think, now at an inflection point. But I think we might have got there much more sooner uh, than I thought. China, quite naturally, China was a massive beneficiary, by the way, of the US military in Asia. In the 1980s, when China started to uh, reform and modernize and build their economy, uh, Deng Xiaoping didn't want to spend much on the military early on. He wanted to put that into other things to build up the economy. And of course, uh, China was able to rely on the peaceful environment effectively underpinned by US security. China was a big beneficiary of that. Of course, when China joined the WTO, China hadn't done anything to build up this institution. China simply plugged in uh, and off it went. And China's been a massive beneficiary of the global trading system. Now, I might say not everybody thought they would be. Uh, there's the famous book, The Coming Collapse of China. That was written in 2000, and it was predicated on the basis that China wouldn't cope with the WTO, but they did. So China benefited from the US military umbrella. They benefited from Western-built institutions, the so-called rules-based order. But naturally, over time, uh, now that China is stronger, it doesn't want to rely on America anymore. It doesn't want to rely on America to protect its ships of oil and iron ore coming through the Malacca Straits. Why would it? Um, the US and uh, uh, China are strategic rivals. Um, increasingly, they, you know, uh, the trade and economic cooperation used to be the area which bound them together. Now they're deep economic rivals as well. So China would like to take over from America in many respects, but it's not so easy. First, one reason the US works in Asia is because it's from outside Asia. If you look at China in Asia, China has territorial disputes with China, uh, sorry, Japan, Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, in a sense with Indonesia, maritime boundaries, not territorial boundaries. So it can't easily slip into the role played by America because it has all sorts of conflicts with these countries. Um, another reason I think China can't take over easily is that China knows itself it's not ready to. Um, there's a famous quote in Hillary Clinton's book about her time as Secretary of State, where she meets her Chinese counterpart. This is, the, is at the time of the so-called pivot to Asia. And Mrs., you know, Mrs., Mrs. Clinton talks about the pivot to Asia, and her Chinese counterpart says, why don't you just pivot out of here? <laughs> um, and it's a great line, but I don't think it's really true. I think would China would like the US to sort of go into bourgeois decline in Asia, you know, to leave slowly, retreat gradually back to the other side of the Pacific, because if the US went quickly, um, uh, 
that would, um, that would be very destabilising, not just for the region, but for China uh, as well. So just to finish up, the US and Ch China on a collision course. I think that's long been the case. That's the bad side. The good side is that they've always known they were and have worked hard to avoid it. Uh, under Trump, that's changing. Uh, Trump has become obsessed by China. I don't think I need to remind you about that. But the sort of deep state, so-called, or the Pentagon state, the foreign policy establishment, the military establishment, which was once largely in favor of a policy of engagement with China, has now changed. Uh, I don't think they support containment of China because that's impossible, but they support pushing back against China in all manner of ways. So that makes Australia's position even harder. We've got that old John Howard view, we don't need to choose between our sort of security allies and our economic uh, partners. In fact, I think we're making choices every day. There was one decision announced today on Huawei, that should make it pretty clear. On economic issues generally though, I think Australia might side with, Ch with China, just as we did with Japan when the US and Japan were in their trade wars, because China is standing up for values in trade now that are much more aligned with our interests. In security though, the opposite is the case. Australia still does not trust China and thus is stuck with the US. That means, I think, that in, the, in Australia's case, to finish in Australia, uh, I could talk about the Turnbull reset, but obviously that's all gone now. Um, and I suspect that um, uh, we've got some representatives from the Chinese government here, and they can correct me if I'm wrong, but I suspect in Beijing they might be waiting for regime change in Australia now, uh, because what's the point of dealing with the coalition government? Um, from their perspective. I'm not saying they'll get a better deal from the Labor Party. I'm not saying they should get a better deal from the Labor Party, but the Labor Party at least might be a, a stable government um, and be able to actually <clears throat> uh, manage the relationship. But the general point about China and Australia, and I think it's because of all the background I've painted out, is we have to get used to a relationship which, which can accommodate and manage tension because there's going to be a lot of problems and a lot of difficult issues to work through. And unless you can get the relationship right at the top, it's going to continue on as it has for the last one and a half years with all sorts of brush fires breaking out all over the place. Um, I'm not going into here about who's to blame for this, that or the other, but I think the big point about East Asia is the we're at an inflection point, but it's an inflection point that may take decades to sort of <clears throat> play out and in the meantime, we're going to be choosing between our economic partners and our security allies all the time. So I'll finish on that point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been um, really given a treat tonight with Richard's presentation of the region. I know he's willing to take questions. Um, we do, of course, always spruik the rules-based order, and there are rules associated with questions. If you can keep them short, keep them to a question, um, and we'll get through as many as we possibly can before we have to finish for the evening. Hands up if you're interested. Straight up the back. We might go second row from the back, black jacket, and then the, the back. I think there might be a microphone coming to you. Thanks, Richard. Very interesting. You mentioned that you talked about the sustainability of uh, the US in, uh, in Asia. What about the sustainability of the current uh, Chinese uh, regime? I mean, how sustainable is that given um, what we know about it? <clears throat> well, it's, it's in, you, can t you can paint any scenario you want for China. The, the general thing, though, is that, <clears throat> I mean, China has overperformed expectations almost at every turn. Uh, so it's, it's very hard to, um, you know, I think it's very hard to be too uh, pessimistic or sort of write China off. I mean, we do have a gen general sense, you know, not, not just in Australia and other countries, because the political system is different. Uh, 
because the political system is a sort of an old-fashioned Leninist system uh, and the like, that it ultimately can't beat us because it's the wrong system. And, and we're getting a real-time empirical test of that theory now. Um, so to look at it a number of ways, I mean, I still think China, Chinese economy has got a lot of growth left in it, uh, but it can't, it, it also has some real weaknesses which have not been managed or faced up to yet. Um, just a couple of points. Uh, from the 2020, you know, China will go off the demographic cliff. Uh, you're going to have fewer and fewer workers to um, provide for <clears throat> uh, an older and older population. Uh, Chinese productivity, total factor productivity, whatever you want to call it, has actually been a big underperformer uh, compared to other countries, even Japan in recent years. Now, that may be a structural issue because of the sort of the state having the commanding heights of the economy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's one issue, is the ageing population. That, that sort of demographic dividend that China uh, enjoyed, that's gone. Um, Urbanisation, which came along with that, the dividends that you come, easy growth from urbanisation, that's being diminished now. Uh, you know, China is no longer a dominant rural society, it's become an urban society. <clears throat> There's the issue of debt. That's very hard to um, uh, be dogmatic about. Uh, you know, the Chinese government um, has done a lot to try and address this issue uh, in recent years. But we're at another point now, for example, with the slowing economy, pressure from America on tariffs, and the issue, uh, the debate inside China has started again about the issue of deleveraging. Mm. You saw a very public fight recently between the Ministry of Finance and the People's Bank uh, about how any new stimulus program should be handled. You have a big debate in China about whether there should be any stimulus at all or whether they should take pain in the service of deleveraging to sort of purge the debt uh, from the system. Uh, and finally, of course, you know, I've, uh, one, it sounds odd, but I think it's quite good as a journalist to stay naive. So when things do happen, you still have the capacity for shock. So with all the Western financial crises over many years, not just in 2008, I've been absolutely shocked by what's happened in <clears throat> mainly US banks, actually, and European banks, um, the sorts of things uh, people have done and gotten away with. Um, and so the, you know, I've got a lot of respect for the technocrats at the PBOC and the Ministry of Finance in China. They think they now have a good handle on the size of the debt. But I, I, I can tell you we will be shocked when the tide goes out in China to see all sorts of things that have happened in terms of leverage, loans, different forms of collateral and the like. Um, so I think there will be a financial crisis in China at some stage. Uh, I could go on and on about this, but uh, it's not like Lehman Brothers. All debt is sovereign, basically. Uh, but there's a lot of collateralized obligations, and unwinding that, I think, is going to be very difficult. The one thing that China has over America, of course, nobody went to jail in America after 2008. China is sending a lot of people to jail <laughs> for financial crimes. Um, and maybe that will help clean up the system. I wonder if you can pass the microphone back. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. That was a masterful summary. Um, the, the border between the system that dominates Japan and the system that dominates China is arguably the DMZ in Korea. And it's a stark contrast. And I wonder how you see the Korean Peninsula changing given America's eventual disengagement and China's eventual rise. <clears throat> so we're talking about the DMZ in Korea? Yes. Yeah, well, it's hard to know what's happening with Korea. I mean, I'll say a few things. The, um, <clears throat> you know, the first thing to remember, I think, about China and North Korea is, is they don't really get on. <clears throat> this idea that used to be close as lips and teeth, that's obviously not true. Um, uh, China has done quite a good job um, at uh, playing itself back into this diplomatic game, putting itself at the centre of the issue. Um, you know, I think they had very little respect for Kim Jong-un on any number of fronts for destabilising, um, you know, their neighbourhood, for being a sort of 33-year-old leader of a country. I think they sort of have some respect for age, not him, um, uh, and the like. Um, and uh, the... Um, 
And also because the Chinese, I think, for uh, a long, long time have been trying to persuade the North Koreans to do what they've done, in other words, liberalise their economy. To give you one example, when I went back to Shanghai in 2000 to live, one day half of the city came to a halt because the Chinese were giving uh, Kim Jong-il a tour of the joint venture Buick uh, GM plant to show him, say, look, you can be a single-party state, you can make American cars, you can get rich, and you can stay in power. Um, and, but the Kim Jong-il never took it on board. Kim Jong-un might be, I think. So I think that's the big, it sounds kind of uh, boring, but you know, we're not gonna get unification, right? Forget about that. Uh, where we might get a sort of you know, diminution of tensions between the two Koreas, that's a good thing. We're not gonna get denuclearization, forget about that. And if it did, we did get it, it would take decades. The thing that might happen, which would be good, is that North Korea finally might have economic reform. Uh, China would be happy with that. The provinces next to North Korea and China have uh, struggled economically. South Korea would be happy with that. US would be happy with that. Even Japan wouldn't mind. So I think don't look for big changes on the Korean Peninsula. Look for small, positive ones. And if we get that, that's a start. Any other questions? Just yell. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. This is very interesting. So I wonder if you could speak briefly. One of the things uh, in the discussion on the rise of China, um, as I listen to reports, uh, media talking, and uh, politicians talking, um, your thoughts on strategically how concerned should Australia be about China's entry into the South Pacific? Um, well, I, th we sh I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, we obviously um, should be concerned about it, and we've been asleep at the wheel. <clears throat> so um, I wonder, I don't know, it's very, I mean, I think China has pr other priorities. I don't think, I don't th don't think it's their priority. I think the South China Sea is, the Belt and Road Initiative is, uh, and the like. Uh, over the longer term, the Pacific uh, might be as well. Um, but, you know, it's up to us. Um, I mean, so in some respects, I wonder whether it's a bit of a sucker punch by the Chinese. They do a little bit there and then we pour in there and out of other places and, you know, that would be clever. Um, but it's kind of our fault. You know, we cut all our sort of soft power assets like shortwave radios and stuff, uh, uh, broadcasts and the like. Um, you know, at the South Pacific Leaders Forum is next week. Is Peter Dutton or Scott Morrison going to go? And even did, even if they, they did go, would they would they give a clue or know what was going on? Um, uh, so you know, we're in a um, you know we have to sort of I don't want to use the, we have to sort of stand in our corner. There's the particular report in the newspaper about a Chinese military base at Vanuatu. Um, I mean, I don't I. Uh, my understanding of that is I think there's been low-level discussions at the level of, uh, you know, Chinese military attaches, no real plans, and maybe the effect of leaking that was to make the Chinese deny it. Do you want to contradict me? <laughs> so it may have been a kind of information operation. I don't think there's a military base about to be built uh, in Vanuatu. Well, it's a little bit, you know, in the book generally only so many minutes in the day type thing, and I just wanted to focus on China and Japan. I mean, Russia is interesting. There's quite a remarkable, you know, China and Russia, uh, there are many different views on this, <clears throat> um, whether they've simply got a relationship of convenience. Uh, I think it's gone well beyond that now. Um, you, I think um, uh, Xi and Putin, Xi Jinping and Putin have met maybe, I don't know, is it 26 times or something? Hu Jintao also met Putin many, many times. Uh, they've done big deals on energy. Um, the, U the Soviet, the Russia is a big seller of arms to China. 
I think, incidentally, China has the upper hand these days because Russia needs friends under Western sanctions. I'm not sure if we've ever got a price or struck a price or heard of a price for the oil and gas, um, in particular the gas that Russia is going to sell to China. And I think, you know, because China is in a good position to negotiate a very good deal. Also, in the case of military sales from Russia to um, uh, China, I think the Russians used to sell them the second-hand stuff. Now they get the best stuff and are no doubt reverse engineering a lot of it themselves. I think we had another turning point when we had the Pentagon report out last year or the US sec annual security review and they called Russia and China, they put them together and called them revisionist powers. Uh, I'm not sure whether that was wise. Um, and very soon after that, the, 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 one of the most senior, I think the head of the Chinese military, I don't think it was the head of the CMC, maybe a deputy Ch Central Military Commission member, went to Moscow and literally said, I'm here to show solidarity with my Russian counterpart after the US government report. Um, Russia and China have both got an interest in giving the big middle finger to the US on all sorts of issues. Uh, and um, <clears throat> in the Middle East, uh, not so much in the Korean Peninsula, although or that may change. Russia's a little bit marginalised there uh, for various reasons. Um, so I think actually, you know, the, the, you know, there's been there's a deep legacy of suspicion. I've been to a lot of Russian border towns, China, you know, and the Chinese run rings around the Russians. They often look down on them as drunks and the like. And the Russians naturally are very paranoid about the Chinese actually occupying that area one day. Um, but I think they've gotten past that and the relationship seems to be pretty sturdy for both of them, actually. Did you have your hand up? Yeah. Great. I think we've got time for one last question. What do you see Japan trying to do with the Japanese, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, and so on <coughs> because of the history of Japan? Well, Japan is, is pretty interesting in that respect, actually. Um, Abe, uh, I'm very critical of him on history issues. He's a terrible revisionist and used to drive the Americans crazy by making all these statements about comfort women and the, women and the like. Eventually, he's learned to shut up, um, uh, which is a good thing. On diplomacy in Asia, though, he's been uh, probably the best performing Japanese prime minister we've seen in decades. He's made more trips uh, to the Philippines, Vietnam, particularly India, uh, than any other Japanese prime minister. Um, he, um, uh, you know, the old system in Asia used to be the hubs and spokes, the US with the hub and the US would have bilateral relations with each country. That's changing now because of the diminution of the US role. It's now sort of networks. So it's Japan, India, Japan, Vietnam, Australia, Vietnam, uh, even Vietnam, Philippines, all manner of different relationships forming now in an effort to deal with what is you know, a new world. Uh, China, a powerful China. Uh, so Abe in that respect, I think diplomatically has been quite a success and the most important relationship in that respect is Japan-India. Um, Abe's, it's a long story, Abe's got a bit of a soft spot for India, etc. Uh, I think the Indians want Japan there as to offset China uh, and the like. Um, so, uh, you know, and also another one final point, the um, Abe might, and Chinese, China Japanese relations are getting better, better lately for all manner of reasons, partly because of Trump you know, they both have an interest uh, in pushing back against Trump on trade. Uh, and so Abe might go to Beijing in October. That'll be really the first top-level meeting between the leaders in a formal sense in 10 years. Uh, but at this very time, the Japanese are sending one of their... 
that the Japanese have a couple of aircraft carriers, but that it, because it's a sensitive thing to talk about in Japan, they call them helicopter destroyers. Um, that, and Japan is sending one of them to the South China Sea now. So I'm interested to see how um, China reacts to that, actually. Because generally around the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands, you know, China keeps constant patrols around it. Very clever. They have the fishing boats in the first ring, the sort of Coast Guard in the second ring, and the Navy in the third ring, and keeping up constant pressure. But I think they, they're drawing that down a little bit in, because in the service of better relations. But the Japanese sending this uh, vessel, as they did last year, to the South China Sea, I'm interested to see whether the Chinese, you know, don't overreact to that ahead of Abe coming to visit, uh, expecting we ex an expectant visit to China. We might bring tonight to a close, if that's OK. Um, and it's my great pleasure oh. to offer a vote of thanks to you, Richard. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Caitlin Byrne. I'm the director of the Griffith Asia Institute. And tonight, I've got to go back to my notes. I think... Richard, it's really been a treat for us to have you here. And I'm, I'm so pleased that you have persisted in, in unravelling the Sino-Japanese relationship for us because it's something we are consumed with in this part of the world. It is significant for us. And I think what you've done tonight is really laid out East Asia as a palimpsest, a region that is layered and overwritten by interactions, animosities, disputes and dilemmas where time, whether it's past, present or future, is blurred, where shifting moods and political rhetoric give rise to contradictory yet deep dilemmas of success and failure. You've reminded us, I think, of the relativity of power, of the significance of understanding and being able to deal with a world that is complex, contested and sometimes contradictory. And I've got to say this, I am not talking about the Australian political landscape. <laughs> Couldn't leave the night without at least having a, a go at our politicians. Um, so thank you. You know, you've reminded us as well that there is a deep interweaving that sometimes we forget between security, politics, economics and business. You know, and it, it is actually important for us to try and unravel all of these different dimensions um, through one lens. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you to Lowy Institute as well. I think it's, it's very important for Australia that you're back in the country um, and that you've brought your insights and your expertise with you to share with us. Um, if I can, though, ladies and gentlemen, before you go, ask you to pop a date claimer in your diaries for our next Perspectives Asia lecture, which will be on the 6th of September. We will be discussing something that's, that's very important for our region, the, the South Pacific, the referenda for independence, New Caledonia and the autonomous region of Bougainville, both heading towards referenda. New Caledonia on the 4th of November this year, Bougainville the 15th of June next year. And we have an outstanding panel of experts who will really be discussing the challenges the issues and the risks and implications associated with these two political uh, events. Ms Denise Fisher, former Australia Consul General of Noumea. Professor Kieran O'Farkley, a Professor of Politics and Public Policy at Griffith University. Mr Anthony Reagan, who's with the Department of Pacific Affairs at ANU. And finally, Mr Emmanuel Djibouti, Director of the... Sorry, the Djib Djibao... Djibouti, I don't know... I got my J and my B mixed up. Director of the Jibao Cultural Centre. Um, I think that will be quite an extraordinary discussion and something that really holds significance for us here in Queensland. So please do come and join us for that event. Um, but just in closing, once again, thank you, Richard. Thank you to our sponsors, Yering Station, for the drinks beforehand and to the Queensland Con for the music that led us in here. I think Dominic did a great job tonight. Uh, thank you to you all for coming out and we look forward to seeing you next month.